Ni hao and welcome to episode 8 of my Mao's uh, China vlog. Um, this time we are finishing our um, little trek through topic 2 which looks at the economy and particularly looking at uh, what impact Mao had on the Chinese economy. Um, we've looked at agriculture and last time we looked at the first five-year plan particularly focusing on industry and this time we're focusing on the second five-year plan um, sometimes known as or often known as, as the Great Leap Forward. So uh, we're going to wade into this, uh, we'll look at what happened and then we're going to talk about um, what change overall, what successes and failures there were overall and also perhaps uh, reflect upon the bigger kind of narrative of, of economic transformation. So uh, Mao, um, after the first five-year plan, was feeling relatively confident. In fact, um, the first five-year plan finishes in 1956 and if you remember, um, the uh, agricultural um, gathering together, collectivization, um, was going pretty well at that stage. Um, and uh, in general, um, the Korean War had finished um, and other areas had been, uh, you know, China had been kind of consolidated into the PRC. And so uh, Mao launched the 100 Flowers campaign in 1957 at the peak uh, kind of of his powers and feeling very good about how everything was going. And that's true here in this period as well, that, that economically we mustn't detach this from the other narratives that we've talked about. Um, he uh, is therefore feeling very confident. He wants to make China into a great economic power. But having modelled the first five-year plan upon the Soviet Union, he now wants to branch out and do more of his own thing. There are two big reasons for this. The first is that he has fallen out, or certainly in the process of falling out, uh, with the Soviet Union, and in particular with Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet leader. Um, he wants to compete with the Soviet Union um, and do that in a Chinese way. Um, Khrushchev has talked about uh, or talked about overtaking the, the Americans uh, economically by 1980. And Mao said, well, the People's Republic of China will overtake the UK uh, in the next 50 years. There is a sense also um, of Mao reflecting upon um, China needing to do things a different way because it is a different country. And Mao looks at the strengths of China and sees that actually its big strength is its population. And so um, mass mobilization wow. is a big part of this second five-year plan, this great leap forward that they're going to make. Not just a little step forward, a great leap forward. Um, and to kind of bound up and over all of this, there's a big feeling of confidence in the communist bloc as a whole, um, partly because uh, of Sputnik and the technological advancements that the Soviets are making. It seems like in the mid to late 50s that maybe the Soviets are ahead of America in, in a number of areas. So all that said, yeah, Mao is kind of riding a little bit of the crest of a wave and feels quite confident. And also, as we said with the 100 Flowers campaign and the anti writers campaigns generally, that there's not really anyone around to challenge him, to dissuade him uh, of these strategies. As I said in the agricultural um, section dealing with this period, that Mao talked about wanting to walk on two legs at this time. And what he meant by that is he wants to increase both agricultural production and also industrial production, and in particular steel production at the same time. Uh, not to kind of do one and then the other, but to twin track them both forward. As he plans to base this uh, on mass effort, as we've said, so both by collecting agriculture into these enormous communes, but also through the policy, as we'll see here, of backyard fairnesses, of encouraging small groups of Chinese people, family groups and, and groups in factories and schools and um, other collective groups around the country to make their own contribution to the, uh, to the, the production of steel um, so that by everybody making a bit, China will make an enormous amount. In the um, rhetoric of the day, General Grain and General Steel were seen as kind of being the big commanders uh, of this um, second five-year plan, this great leap forward, because they were going to be the two foci um, of this. Now, in terms of industrial strategy, um, it's probably worth saying that, that there is not so much a strategy as just um, uh, some impetus given to ideas and some targets set and then people are kind of told to to get on with it um, and and to do it so again quite like the soviet um, economic um, issues that you might have come across before there's a, a lack of kind of strategic thought through how we get there and much more a sense of like here we are now that's where i want to be go and do it that said um there is um, a move within the great leap forward to um, take over 
uh, the state to take over all industrial companies. Um, they are made into state-owned enterprises or SOEs. Um, and in these uh, state-owned enterprises, the Communist Party would dictate prices, both prices that they sold um, and, of course, bought things at. They dictated production targets and they also set guaranteed wages. This is part of the iron rice bowl, which I talked about last time, which is the guarantee that's given to workers. Um, they guaranteed their home, health care and education as rights as Chinese citizens. And they're also guaranteed their job security um, and uh, incentives around that all, all in together. Now, what this meant this because it's an iron rice bowl because it's unbreakable. This is a guarantee from the state. Um, and this is amazing for workers. It really um, changes their their living standard, not not improving it massively to kind of all being super wealthy, but taking it out of um, the problems and um, poverty that many of them had have struggled with before to a, a subsistence level at least. Um, but the the downside is that it lowers incentives of workers. There's no incentives to um, to work hard or to exceed um, their targets. And it lead, led into one of the things that led into poor performance um, industrially. Also, um, we're talking about workers here, but the same is true of the management. There's no extra incentive for managers to work their teams more efficiently, uh, or more effectively, to find new ways of doing things, to experiment uh, or to bring in um, new ideas because they get paid the same and their targets will be the same. And that is seen as being um, one of the big sort of limitations or reasons for limitations uh, of the Great Forward. Um, but we're going to talk just a little bit about successes, first of all. Um, the successes are very limited. Um, there are some small scale uh, irrigation projects which are completed, which are helpful. Um, on paper, the production figures do also look good, at least up to 1960, uh, which say the famine really kicks in um, and impacts upon um, China all over really. So for example, steel production was 5.4 million tons in 1957, but it leapt to 13 million tons by 1960, and then 8 million uh, down again see, uh, in 1961. But even 8 million is above 5.4 million, which it had been four years previous. Chemical fertilizers, another good example, 0.8 million tons produced in 1957, 2.5 million uh, in 1960, so that's uh, trebling. Um, and then uh, back to 1.4 million uh, in 1961. It says 14 million in my notes, but it's clearly 1.4 million rather than 14. So dropping back again, um, kind of by what, 50% um, in 1961. But again, if you trace the line from 1957 to 61, there is an increase in production. And the, the argument would be that actually the steel production in particular is not of quality steel. It's, it's poor quality steel that's made um, and that the peak of 1960 is not sustained. The other thing that you could say in terms of success of the five-year plan uh, is that uh, there are a number of sort of bigger projects that are completed. Tiananmen Square is remodelled famously at this time um, and is um, made to be bigger than Red Square in Moscow as part of uh, Mao's competition with the Soviet Union. Plus, there were 10 great buildings built in Beijing um, if, for 1959 to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the revolution. These include the Great Hall of the People uh, and Beijing Railway Station. Um, and they're all public buildings. Um, the Ming, Tomb, Ming Tombs Dam is built as well um, to create a reservoir uh, near Beijing. Um, and the first stage of the Lanqing Railway. Uh, Lanqing is L A N. Q-I-N-G, um, which was a plan to build a railway all the way out to Tibet to connect Tibet to the rest of the People's Republic of China. So that's um, all of those are kind of successes. Um, private property is banned. Um, peasants are put in communes, don't forget, at this time as well. And that ideologically, this stage uh, of the economic plan is also very successful. The state owned enterprises would fit in with that. However, there are a number of um, problems with uh, the Great Leap Forward. And the targets were unrealistic. Um, as we've said, there was a lack of actual planning. There were just the targets kind of thrown about um, without thinking about how people would get there. We've already said that the quality 
is really poor. Um, and it was so poor. Um, uh, well, let's talk about uh, backyard furnaces now. The backyard furnaces scheme um, failed uh, because peasants were focusing on production of steel um, uh, rather than on the farming that they should have been doing. So that contributes to the famine. And then the production of the steel um, not being, uh, firstly, not being experts at it, it's not very good steel. Then because they start to melt down other steel things to try and pretend that they're making steel, they make very, very low quality steel. And what happens to a lot of that is that it just gets uh, thrown away at the end. So the quality is really um, so poor that the figures are really misleading when you look at them. Also, uh, as, as a result of the famine, millions of people starved to work, um, start to work, millions of people starved to death. Um, they were unable to work. Um, and Mao's credibility is ruined uh, as a result of all of this. Um, two more things to add in there, that in 1959, the Soviet Union withdrew their technical support and that led to about half of the 300 Soviet-sponsored industrial plants being closed. Um, and um, kind of connected to this, that often projects were really badly planned. So the Three Gate Gorge Dam, uh, which is one of these famous projects that was put on, um, caused so much environmental damage that it, it massively impacted farming around it. Um, and to such a degree that foreigners were actually banned from going to see uh, the Three Gate Gorge Dam. So these are all examples of where poor planning, um, falling out of the Soviet Union, um, and low quality production meant that overall, even though on paper there were some successes, actually the Great Forward was, um, <laughs> well, at least it wasn't a Great Forward, um, it was a bit of a disaster really all around. So uh, what happens as a result of this? Well, it kind of mid um, Great Leap Forward, um, the Lushan um, conference takes place in 1959 in Lushan, uh, July 1959. And at that um, conference, uh, Peng de Huey um, had voiced um, doubts over what was going on. In fact, Peng de Huey, the Minister of Defence, um, was uh, voicing doubts about uh, what was being trumpeted as a record grain harvest, partly because Peng, um, as a former peasant, had visited some farms and had kind of seen what was going on in his home province and couldn't really add up what he had seen with the reports that were coming through. Mao accused uh, Peng of colluding with Khrushchev and replaced him with Lin Biao. And this was uh, mentioned at, at this point because this is just, again, a sign of the precursor, really, to the Cultural Revolution of Mao's growing suspicions of both people around him. And it adds into that untouchable um, nature of Mao that uh, in 1959, um, as the famine was kind of cooking up and as the Great Leap Forward was falling apart, that it drifts on for another couple of years because Mao is unwilling to listen to those people around him. However, eventually uh, Mao does take a step back um, and uh, Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping are temporarily um, allowed to run the Chinese economy instead of Mao. So kind of between 1962 and 1965. Liu and Deng um, so Liu, you can spell L-I-U, Dang is spelled B-E-N-G. Um, they were much more pragmatic, and we said this in the agricultural um, section as well. And they said, uh, or Dong Xiaoping's famous phrase um, was that it doesn't matter if a cat is black or white, so long as it catches mice, it's a good cat. And by this he meant it doesn't matter if it's communist or capitalist, so long as we kind of get the end results, we're not too worried about how things look. So factories were told to make profit, they were told to focus on products, uh, particularly to help agriculture. So that there was more joined up thinking um, in the economy. Um, and as a result, uh, industrial output um, in 1965 was almost double what it had been in 1957. Light industry grew at 27% per annum um, and heavy industry grew at 17% per annum. And they also released um, a number of anti rightist experts uh, from the Lao Gai. So um, overall, then, you might get to 1965 and say, actually, the policies here have uh, brought about um, a big amount of change in China and they've recovered back to 1965. But the process of getting there through the first five year plan, which is broadly successful, um, and Liu and Deng's um, economic reforms, which are broadly successful, in the middle, you've got this kind of swamp land of the Great Leap Forward, which is 
at best a sticky spot um, and actually could be talked about as being a disaster. So you've got this kind of big dip. What that's great for in terms of analysis is to say that actually there is both um, success and failure here. The success is on either end and the, the failure is in the middle. If you asked about Mao or your period stops earlier in 1961 or before that, uh, then you would have to say that by the end things haven't gone so well. The other thing um, to remember is to try and tease apart a little bit ideological success from economic success. There's no doubt that Mao, Mao ideologically is building a, a much more communist economy, both agriculturally um, and industrially. And the state and enterprises and the communes are a big part of that, even though both economically failed to deliver in the way that he wanted. So I hope that's helpful. It's given you an overview um, of the policies um, and uh, next time we'll move on to thinking about the Cultural Revolution. Thanks for watching.